we are unique in the sense that we are both the State Archives and the State History Museum. Currently, in our collections, we have a little over 500,000 artifacts, including everything from archaeological collections to the textiles that we're going to be talking about today. So, um, to give you an idea of how much we've changed over the years, this picture is an early image of our collections on display at the State Capitol. Our first home was actually in the State Capitol until 1940, when construction on our current building, the one you saw before, was complete. So, um, needless to say, our exhibit design has changed over the last century. The Alabama Voices Gallery, which you can see pictured here, was complete in 2014, and there are close to, in this gallery alone, a thousand artifacts on display, including textiles. And I'm going to try to use my little, um, well, I don't see it. Anyway, um, if you look over in the section, you can see um, several textiles from, ah, oh, there we go. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> from several textiles, including uh, the coverlets that you see over here, and then we have some uh, quilts here, and we have dresses. Um, and our oldest, one of our oldest pieces, this coverlet from 1810, is right here. So, uh, this image actually shows the house lights on, so it's a little bit brighter than it is normally. Uh, this was just the house lights were brought up for photography, so you could see a little bit of everything. So, um, storage practices have also changed at the archives. Um, this image was actually, and others like it, were used by the archives founding director, Tom Owens, when he petitioned the state of Alabama to establish the archives. And you can see that um, it, they were in desperate need, and he recognized that history was being lost. Uh, so we've updated a little bit. Uh, this is actually the textile storage area for the archives. Um, in the image, you can see three types of storage that we'll be talking about today. You have our cabinet storage here, you have boxed storage to the left, and then underneath you have rolled storage. Um, even though this looks pretty up-to-date and modern, we are still updating and improving. In fact, we just replaced our old fluorescent lighting with new LED lighting, which you can see here, and that's going to be much better for the textiles. But one key point that I want you guys to take away from this webinar is that preservation is an ongoing project. Perfect storage doesn't happen overnight. So it's best to just breathe deep and take it a step at a time. I just wanted to show off a few of our artifacts a little bit, our textile related artifacts. So. Um, these best practices for storing and preserving textiles are we're going to talk about uh, every kind of textile that you could have in your collection from sports memorabilia to historic textiles. Um, our agenda for the webinar so first we'll discuss what materials are best for storage. We'll, then we'll take a look at best practices for handling textiles. Um, we'll examine uh, types of storage and we'll look at four in particular and then we'll talk about environmental conditions for storage and display. So let's get started by looking at what materials are safe to use in storage. So um, the next few slides we'll look at common materials that we use in textile storage. I'll give a quick rundown of the different types and then we'll go into a little more detail. I've included a handout which you can see in the top left corner, that uh, you can download it and it'll give you resources for where to purchase materials that we'll be discussing about today. So our first material used in textile storage, uh, no pun intended, is fabric. Um, where we'll look at muslin, batting and felt, and stockinette. For our paper materials, we'll look at the acid freeze, those tissues, those tubes, and boxes. 
There we go. Finally, we'll talk about the common plastics used in textile stores, and those are the polyesters, um, the polypropylenes, and the polyethylenes. So, um, muslin is probably the, the most used fabric material for me in textile storage. You want to use undyed cotton or a poly, uh, cotton polyester blend of muslin. Uh, it's commonly used as a barrier fabric, as well as creating slings or cradles for textiles. But um, I also use it, though, when photographing large quilts. I'll just place the muslin on, in an area, a safe area, on the floor, and then put the quilt on top of the muslin and use a ladder to photograph the quilt from above. It just makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but What's important, though, is that if you purchase muslin, you need to uh, wash it. It's, they have finishes that are applied by the manufacturer during the weaving process to make the, um, the fiber weave a little easier. These finishes can be an attractant to pests, so you want to make sure that they are removed from the muslin before it's uh, used in storage. And I recommend using a mild soap, and I typically use Orvis paste. And what's that? So uh, Orvis paste can be found in, on sites like Amazon, or you can actually find it in local quilt shops. It's a common mild soap used by quilters. But um, the tip is for using Orvis is that it is concentrated and will need to be diluted before washing your muslin. I usually dilute anywhere from one to two tablespoons of Orvis per wash, if, um, and that's in a washing machine. If I'm washing something smaller, then I use a little bit less. Um, you just want to make sure, though, that when you're using Orvis paste, that you rinse all of the soap from the muslin thoroughly. Uh, usually for me is uh, around two rinses uh, in water. So any soap that remains in the textile can be an attractant for pests and we don't want that. So uh, batting and felt. You want to look for batting that has been spun bonded and felt that has been needle punched. Why? Uh, well, because most batting or felt purchased in local fabric stores use an adhesive um, that's been applied to the fibers to make them uh, stick together. Uh, this can be detrimental to your textiles over time because the he adhesive will yellow and can transfer to your textiles, your artifacts. Um, it's important to check the labels before purchasing. Um, batting and felt can be used in both storage and display. It can cushion textiles in storage, and you can also use it if you're making mannequins. Um, modern mannequins won't have the silhouette of historic textiles. Uh, batting can help to pad out and shape mannequins for display. It's important that your mannequins have uh, proper size and silhouette to avoid putting uh, extra stress on your textile when it's on display. Uh, stockinette. Uh, stockinette is a knit material that has a lot of stretch. Um, it can expand sometimes up to twice its size. You'll want to use um, a cotton or a cotton polyester blend stockinette, uh, and it can be used in storage for padding artifacts um, or in the mannequin making process. Again, when you pad out your mannequin, you can cover it uh, and create a barrier between the mannequin and the batting and your textile. Um, you can also use a stockinette when making padded hangers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But like muslin, stockinette must be washed before being used. So paper materials. Um, before we get into the different types of paper materials, I just want to give a quick definition of what acid-free means. If you know this, just ignore it. 
um, materials that are acid free have had the lignin and other impurities removed giving them a balanced or neutral pH. Uh, for me acid free tissue the first of the paper materials we're going to talk about is the most frequently used material in textile storage. It acts as a barrier between textiles as padding and filler in boxes. There are two types of acid-free tissue, buffered and unbuffered. Uh, buffered tissue paper uses an additive of calcium carbonate as a buffer. It acts to neutralize any acid they may, that may form in the tissue at a later date. Uh, but that said, buffered tissue um, should only be used in textiles that are plant-based. That's cotton, linen, even hemp. Um, you really don't want to use buffer tissue on animal-based textiles. That's leather, wool, or silk, because that additive um, can eventually um, harm your uh, animal-based textiles. Uh, unbuffered, though, has no additive and a neutral pH. It can be used with both animal and plant-based textiles. So. Um, it, to avoid any confusion, um, especially if you have um, volunteers that are helping out and can't tell the difference or don't know the difference between the two tissues, for me it's just easier to use unbuffered with everything. So our next paper material that we'll talk about um, are acid-free tubes. Tubes are wonderful for rolling larger textiles like quilts, coverlets, smaller rugs, and even tapestries that are too big to fit into a box. Uh, tubes can come in varying sizes up to 10 feet in length and 10 inches in diameter. Uh, you can even cut them to accommodate your textile. Um, but those are the pros. The cons of acid-free tissue or rolling storage, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is that they can be expensive and take up a lot of room in your storage areas. Acid-free boxes. So um, acid-free boxes are buffered. So before you place a textile in an acid-free box, you want to make sure that you're lining it with either a suitable tissue paper or washed undyed muslin to create that barrier. So plastics. Um, while plastics are considered damaging to textiles for long-term preservation, uh, there are three types of plastics that are considered suitable for long-term storage. Those are polyester, polypropylene, and polyethylene. Uh, polyester film, um, I use mylar quite a bit in our textile storage. Uh, they're inert polyester films that are, are wonderful really truly for storing smaller textiles like samplers or fragments. And I actually use it um, in rolling storage for quilts, but we'll talk about that in a minute. These um, smaller textiles uh, can be sandwiched between two layers or rolled in the film. Um, Polyethylene uh, foams like ethafoam and flora uh, are great for storage and display. Uh, polyethylene foam can serve as a barrier material, a, um, a cushion for artifacts, or a support system for textile storage. It comes in varying thickness and can be carved or cut to suit your artifact. Uh, you can also get polyethylene foam on a roll. Uh, from any uh, one eighth to half an inch thickness, and you can see the two different types here in this slide. Uh, Marvel Seal is marvelous. Uh, it's an aluminized polyethylene and polypropylene barrier film. It prevents water vapor or off gassing from transmitting to your textiles. It can also be used for lining wood shelves, drawers, or the bottom of cedar chests. Uh, 
Marvel seal is also heat bonding, so it can be affixed to acidic tubes to offset the cost of purchasing acid-free tubes. And we'll talk about that when we get to uh, rolling storage. But you can make small bags. Uh, if you have a tacking iron or a heating iron, you can uh, make a little bag of Marvel seal and store smaller textiles. Uh, Coroplast is uh, corrugated polypropylene and can be purchased as boxes or in sheets for making customized boxes. Uh, benefit to using Coroplast is that it's a rugged material that doesn't change or uh, off-gas over time. Uh, a pro to using Coroplast is that it can help keep textiles dry in an instance of flood or leak. However, if the material is exposed to fire, it could melt. So uh, before we talk about how you actually are going to be packing um, textiles into things like boxes or putting them in rolls, let's talk about handling textiles. Um, these are just a few tips before you get started. You want to remove any jewelry or anything that can snag on a textile. And always have clean, dry hands or use nitrile gloves. Um, th there has been some debate for many years about gloves and textiles, and there are times to use them and times when you shouldn't use them. Um, for many years, the typical image of a curator was somebody wearing white gloves. But uh, due to the delicate nature of textiles, clean, dry hands are preferable. You can feel the textile better with bare hands, and you're less likely to transfer things like dirt and fibers from other textiles. Um, in some cases, though, gloves are necessary. Example, um, some textiles in the 19th century used hazardous materials in a manufacturing process. If you've ever heard of um, arsenic green as the color, it's where they used arsenic as a mordant for certain green dyes. Um, there's also celluloid sequins that if you touch them, you leave a fingerprint on them. So again, there are times to use gloves and times where bare hands are more preferable. But you always, before handling your textile, want to inspect it for stability. If it's fragile, you need to take more care. If it's more sturdy material, um, it, it's a little bit easier to transport and move. But during the whole process, you want to make sure that your textile is supported at all times. So let's look at types of textile storage. We have uh, four here that we're going to talk about, which are hanging storage, box storage, cabinet storage, and rolled storage. We're going to start off with hanging textiles. Um, and it's important when you're considering uh, using a hanging system that you only hang textiles that are structurally sound. Um, you want to use padded hangers to avoid uh, creasing or uh, stress in the shoulders. Um, some textiles that are not suitable for hanging are items that are lace or net, um, heavily beaded items that are going to weigh, especially those 1920s flapper dresses that are heavily beaded. They'll cause stress at the shoulder points. Uh, knit items, which can stretch over time, or those cut on the bias. Um, bias, for those of you that aren't aware, is when the fabric is cut on a 45 degree angle. That angle of cut makes it more pliable um, and stretchy, if you will. Um, this becomes an issue, especially for 1930s, um, when bias cut dresses were very popular. Um, they were meant to cling and show off the female form, but hanging them means that over the years, the dress ends up looking like it belongs to someone who is eight feet tall. So you want to make sure that you don't hang uh, a bias cut dress. Oh, and use wood hangers. Um, 
don't use wood hangers. Oops, sorry. Um, you don't want to use wood hangers. You can actually, um, in some of the resources that uh, listed in the textile resources handout, there'll be a tutorial on how to make your own padded hangers using polyester batting and um, the stockinette to cover them. And uh, the cons of um, hanging textile stores, there's a lot of pros, uh, but the cons are that it takes up a lot of space in your storage area. And you have to consider when you're thinking about ways of storing things, if you have enough room for hanging storage. So um, I've had to pull this image off of uh, Pinterest, actually, because we don't have any hanging storage here at the archives, but it's, uh, it is a viable way for you to store your textiles. And I really liked this um, storage because they've uh, covered it um, with uh, Tyvex bags, um, which is another uh, material that you can use, uh, or you can cover them with muslin. But they have... Um, given a description on the outside of the textile that's on the inside of the bag and they have an image of the textile as well. It helps uh, when you're looking for something if you don't have to handle uh, the artifacts. Um, you want to handle them as few times as possible so having something which identifies what it is on the outside makes looking for things a little bit easier. So box storage. Um, Boxes are fantastic because they can be stacked uh, for increased storage space. They block out dirt and light, and they can protect against in insect infestation. They don't 100% block out insect infestations, but they do help protect against it. When using a box, you want to make sure that it will fit on your shelf and uh, fit the textile that you are placing it into it. And you can look in the resources list um, for uh, the usual suspects when it comes to purchasing museum supplies, university products, talus, and you can, there are two sizes of textile boxes that you can use and you just want to make sure that you're purchasing the right one for your artifact. So uh, here we have our box storage on the shelf and you can see that the boxes sit back from the edge of the shelf and we have uh, identified the artifacts on the inside with the collection name and its accession number and a brief description of what is uh, what the artifact is. So uh, this rolled piece of acid-free tissue paper is invaluable in storage. Um, I have this here because we're going to talk about um, boxing textiles, and this guy will come into play quite a bit. Um, we use pieces like this to pad textiles. Um, so in the next few slides, when I talk about padding, keep this little guy in mind. Uh, to make your tissue padding, you want to, on a sheet of acid-free tissue, accordion fold back and forth the sheet about halfway and then roll the rest up and you can twist the ends to make it a little more secure. Uh, yes, um, I see Maya. Do you fold textiles when storing them in boxes? You can. As long as the textiles are padded, um, the, in the folds and you're creating um, gentle curves, not sharp creases, you can store folded textiles. And you'll see that. Well, I will show you a little demonstration in just a minute. Uh, the, uh, Christina, good question. Do you have issues with tissue losing shape? Um, you can over time, uh, especially if you stack more than one textile in a box, you get compression and the tissue can compress over time. Um, but that accordion fold in the tissue actually helps support it just a little bit better than if you just rolled up the material. At least that's what we found when we've used these. So, um, when you begin to pack boxes, um, these are the kind of the steps that we go through as we are packing the boxes. 
the first thing you want to do is uh, examine the textile for strength. Uh, and it's important to support the costume along fold lines, there you go guys, to prevent sharp creases. As the textile ages, uh, crease lines become areas of weakness where fibers will bend and eventually fracture. Um, you want to use acid-free tissue, like you saw before, to pad fold lines in areas like sleeves and shoulders and anytime, anywhere you place you have to fold them. You want to be careful with um, some costumes that have closures uh, that can snag on embellishments and textiles. And the best way to prevent that is to put extra acid-free tissue as a barrier between those uh, closures and the textile that they're going to be laying against. Uh, and again, when storing multiple textiles in a box, separate the layers with tissue paper and always put the heavier items on the bottom. That way you don't get that compression in the box. Uh, but it's important not to stuff your textile boxes uh, full of textiles. Um, just You can just use your best judgment for um, whether or not you're overloading the box. And usually like three or four textiles is the most that I will put in a box. So when working with textiles that are along your box, especially these long um, dresses, 19th century um, dresses, you want to fold and pad the folded areas. You can um, fold at the waistline to fit the textile in your box is the good area to do it. But you want to make sure that any empty space that you have in the box is filled with tissue to ensure that the textile doesn't shift in the box when you're moving it. So here we have um, have an example. We have packed up an 1897 um, wedding ensemble that was actually purchased in Paris. Um, by Bossy O'Brien Hundley, uh, and she had wonderful taste in clothing. Uh, you, if you look in the middle, you'll see that the skirt, which is the heaviest portion of the dress, has been packed on the bottom, and the bodice um, has been uh, placed on top un after a layer of acid-free tissue has been placed down. And you can see our pads were placed um, underneath the sleeves where they fold over. We lightly padded um, the sleeves, but especially around the neck area um, and the shoulders to support that. And then finally, um, at the end, we've put additional tissue paper over the top. And then you have a, pad, a packed box. Um, sometimes there are um, special items like that silk velvet dress um, that we only wanted that suit to go into the box by itself. So you can see our tag below which lists who the dress belonged to, um, a brief description of what was in there, and the accession numbers for each one of the items that went into the box. So, uh, quilts. Uh, quilts can be folded and boxed, but when folding a quilt, you want to have help. And you can see uh, our textile curator, uh, Diane Barnard, there, who is my assistant in folding this one up. And another important thing is when you're folding um, large textiles like quilts is that you want to make sure that your work surface is big enough to support the entire quilt. Um, you also want to examine the quilt uh, for former qu quilt lines, oh well sorry, former fold lines. Um, you want to make sure that when you fold this you're folding it in a different stronger area that hasn't been creased before. And you want to create uh, cushioned areas of support where you see our pads here. So we decided where we wanted to fold it. We placed the pads there and then we'll fold it over. Which you'll see in the top left, we folded it over. We we're folding this one in thirds. Um, after we folded the first one, 
we'll place pads in the second area and fold it over and you can see that in the top right hand corner. Um, once you have folded it into thirds, you want to check to make sure that the quilt will fit into your box and you can see us measuring it there in the upper right hand corner. Um, then in the bottom left, we have put in our tissue pads and we're going to fold the quilt in sections over padded support. And in our bottom right image, you can see as it was folded up, we were creating gentle curves, not sharp creases. And you can see that the tissue placed in there. So once you have your quilt folded, we have placed it in our box. You can see um, on the, we have lined the box with acid-free tissue that extends over the sides where we sort of created this little sling for it and makes it easier for moving uh, the quilts in and out of boxes. But we've also, uh, to the left of the quilt, we have created uh, where the empty space was we crumpled tissue paper to fill up that space so that as we move the box the quilt doesn't shift and then we have folded over that um, acid free tissue sling to create a cover and um, it's all boxed up and you have one happy textile curator so uh, cabinet storage Cabinet storage um, has similar traits to box storage. Uh, the cabinets can be stacked. You really don't want to stack more than two at a time. Uh, they're acid free. They block light and dust from your artifacts and they help prevent uh, pest infestation. And you can use uh, cabinet storage for flat or hanging textiles. But the number one um, pro for cabinet storage is that you can get locking doors. So if you have very valuable textiles, they can be locked in the cabinet storage. Oh, and cabinets also, um, the major thing you don't want to do when storing textiles is create microclimates. Um, so you don't want anything to be perfectly sealed. You want it to have airflow. And cabinet storage, um, most museum quality cabinet storage will have airflow. So you won't have to worry about microclimates. And you can see our uh, textile storage um, cabinet area. We've stacked two, uh, one above the other. And it, we also have the space for labeling um, for location codes on our textiles. So we can go straight to the cabinet and uh, find what we need. And here's an inside view of one of our cabinets. We have some lovely um, bustle era gowns there. We have two of them. Um, when you're putting your textiles in cabinet storage, you want to make sure that there's enough room between the drawers to accommodate artifacts. You can use um, ethafoam uh, or that, uh, that foam on the bottom and then acid-free unbuffered tissue as a barrier between the cabinet and your textile. And the next slide, um, you can see why you want to leave room between the drawers. This um, apron skirt for the bustle dress actually has these wonderful, lovely, fluffy, um, artfully tucked pieces on this apron. And um, they're very high loft, so they stick up quite a bit. So you want to make sure that you're leaving plenty of area so that you can slide that um, drawer out and in without it brushing up against the um, shelf above it. So rolled storage. There are plenty, plenty of pros for rolled storage. It prevents creases. Um, uh, instead of folding, you're rolling these artifacts. It allows for storage of textiles that are too big or thick for boxes. Um, and fragile textiles can be stored safely. But the cons are that it, uh, it takes up a lot of space in your storage areas. 
So um, when rolling a textile, you want to make sure that your textile um, lays out flat on a surface large enough to support the textile. Again, um, it, we're, it's all about support here at the archives. Uh, you want to choose the correct dam diameter tube. Uh, the larger the tube, the less stress on the textile. Uh, you want to cut the tube to the appropriate size. You want to have about three to six inches on either side of the textile to make uh, it easier for maneuvering the tube without handling the textile. Um, you want to make sure as you're, before you roll that you're going to roll the textile onto the tube square, which your sides are going to be even. And you want to gently wrap the textile onto the tube. Um, it's important to know that you can re-roll as necessary because you um, want to avoid telescoping the ends or uh, of the, the quilt. Um, you don't want it to warp, um, and that's what will happen if you start to see this, uh, the telescoping uh, ends. After you have rolled the textile onto the acid-free tube, you want to wrap it with uh, acid-free tissue or muslin or Tyvex or Mylar as a barrier, and you can use uh, twill tape to secure it. So here we have an example of the uh, rolled storage in our textile storage area. We uh, use mylar as the barrier. We have a lot of uh, historic quilt study groups that come through to view our quilts and the mylar makes it easier for them to view the colors and the pattern and the stitching without us having to unroll it for them to view. Um, not that we don't unroll them, but um, the less handling the better. And you can see in the image on the right, we have used archival pens uh, to write the number the accession number of the quilt on the, uh, the outside of the mylar. Uh, but just really quick, on the picture on the right, the third quilt back, that is an amazing quilt made in the 1930s that's made from sock tops. Um, so all of these that you see here are the tops of socks. Isn't that wonderful? It came from um, Fort Payne, Alabama, which was the sock capital of the world. So um, let me get to this next slide. So you want to, if you're rolling textiles and you don't have rolling um, storage, um, we built the wood ones that you saw a little bit earlier. You can also store rolled textiles on shelves, but you want to make sure that you avoid storing the shelves, uh, the rolls directly on the shelves because contact with the shelf forms a pressure point that will break down over time. So we have the ethafoam uh, blocks that we cut up. You can see on the left we've cut a gentle curve out of the top and it fits the um, diameter of the roll so that we can lift up the rolled quilt from the shelf and we avoid adding any undue pressure. So cleaning. Um, I put this in here just because I want everybody to be cautious. Uh, wet cleaning an historic textile is a delicate process that requires guidance to avoid damage. Um, please consult a conservator before cleaning any pieces in your collection. Um, we are able, we have a conservation lab here at the archives, so I'm able to do small bits of conservation. Um, the image that you see on the right is Rufus the Rabbit, which was part of a children's show in Montgomery, Alabama in the 70s and 80s. And I was able to clean him um, with a uh, process of vacuuming, brushing the fur, and um, all in out removing the dust and dirt from the fur. And you can see the difference um, on the, the left and the right. 
So one technique that you can do um, to uh, prolong the life of your textile is vacuuming. Um, and only do this if you're, you're confident uh, in working with your textiles. Uh, the first thing that you want to do is examine the textile to ensure the stability. Yeah, you want to use a vacuum that has variable speed control. In other words, you're controlling how fast the, the suction is on the vacuum itself. And you want to make sure that you're using uh, microsuction attachment kits. These can be found at your local Walmart. Um, and they usually sell for less than $20. But um, these microsuction attachment kits allow for better, more precise control when vacuuming textiles. And what you're doing when you're vacuuming, you're helping to remove any uh, dirt, hair, food particles that might be embedded in the fibers. And you want to use light um, circular motions to remove embedded uh, particles, but you don't want to press down into the textile. Um, you, if I find it easier to work in a grid, it helps me figure out where I am on the textile. Um, that way you can uh, cover the entire area. So the next thing that we want to look at are environmental conditions. And the four things that you see listed here, light, heat, humidity, and pest, are called agents of deterioration and these are the things that you really want to uh, take, pay particular interest to in your storage areas. So the first thing that we're going to look at is light. Light speeds up oxidation which speeds up chemical breakdowns. This means that your fibers will become weak and colors will fade. But just Pointing it out, put a couple stars there in front of it, um, even bolded it for you. Light damage is cumulative and irreversible. Once you have the damage, the damage is always there. So to give you an example of light damage, we have a lovely 1919 inaugural ball gown that belonged to the First Lady of Alabama, uh, Mrs. Kilby. It is a beautiful, um, you know, transitional dress that you see um, as you're heading into the flapper era, you know, as those waistlines are um, lowering and the hemlines are raising. Uh, and it was on display for a very long time. And if you look at this picture, you can just see a little darker color above the waistline. But if I uh, let you get a view of the back, you can see the actual color. Um, the sun, uh, this was displayed near a window in a glass case, which kind of magnified the effect. And um, it really bleached the color from this artifact. So um, these are things that can happen. Um, but we are going to, I know, poor dress. <laughs> uh, and it's a beauty, too. In fact, take a look. When we talk about um, uh, these embellishments that are on the dress that can be um, difficult in, in the weight uh, in, in caring for your textiles is why you wouldn't hang something like this. Um, if you look a little bit closer, and this is magnified, this is a very fine net, but they've used um, gold wire uh, for the embroidery. Uh, so it is massively heavy, and she would have really sparkled as she walked across um, the dance floor. So to prevent light damage, you want to avoid displaying textiles in an environment with harsh lighting. Um, they, I've included in the textile resources a handout on light level recommendations, um, but uh, I'll let you view that. But just to give you a, a little example, silk, which is the more delicate of all the textiles and um, it can really receive the most damage from UV light, um, should be displayed in five foot candles or less um, for uh, less than three months. Uh, it can really fade very quickly. 
um, but light is measured in foot candles, lux, or visible light, um, or uh, lumens for ultraviolet light. And you can uh, monitor how much light exposure your textiles are getting using light meters like the picture that you see on the left. Um, these can be a little bit expensive, but in the long run, well worth it. Or um, actually, you can find an app for light meters on your phone. This was a relatively inexpensive light meter app um, that I take on museum field services trips. And I have used both the light meter on the left and my app at the same time. And there's just a, a little bit of difference between the two. So if you're looking for economic ways to monitor the light in your storage or display areas, um, a light meter app on your phone will do. And you want to um, monitor and log light levels in different areas at different times of the day because you'll see um, the levels are quite different. So another way to uh, limit um, and damage from light exposure is to limit the amount of time that you have the textile on display and rotate it with other pieces in your textile collection. Um, the light levels recommendation will give you um, the time limits, so you know, typical time limits for displaying textiles. Um, something that you can help to do as well is to apply UV filters. Um, you can see a UV film um, which is in the top right hand picture. Um, you can apply that to windows, and for added protection, you can use solar shades that you see in the bottom right-hand corner. So, heat and humidity. Those of us in the South, sometimes it seems like Mother Nature is against us. Um, uh, heat and humidity we have in abundance here. And when you're working with textiles, you want to make sure that you have a constant temperature and humidity. Um, textiles tend to expand and contract within the environment, and so this will weaken fibers over time, um, especially if there's dirt embedded in the textile. So exposure to excessive humidity can cause things like mold, uh, which can damage the textile irreparably. So to prevent damage from heat and humidity, you want to avoid storing textiles if you're in a house museum, in places like hot attics or damp basements, or anywhere um, that you have uh, the large fluctuations in heat and humidity. You want to keep the temperature between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit and keep the humidity at 50%. Um, a good rule of thumb uh, is that in an environment that is comfortable for you is going to be comfortable for your historic textiles. So if you are hot and sticky, your textiles are hot and sticky too. Um, there are instruments and tools that will help you monitor your environment. Hygrothermographs um, record heat and humidity, and we have examples of them on the next slide. Um, both of these are data loggers, so they'll keep a record of the heat and humidity over a certain amount of time. So, um, the one on the right is just digital. Uh, and those are really good, too, if you're trying to, say, talk to your board about environment in storage areas. You'll have data which will back up uh, and show issues that you're having in your storage areas. So, dirt. Um, it adheres to the fibers of your textile. Um, over time, as the fibers expand and contract with heat and humidity, the dirt will work its way through the fibers, causing areas of weakness or breakage. And if you look at the picture on the right, you see those little black dots? The, that's dirt. This is actually a white cotton glove that I just ran my finger over a 
dirty tabletop and you can see the amount of dirt that it picked up and again that dirt over time um, in with exposure to uh, heat and humidity those ex fibers expand and contract and that dirt just works its way through so um, this is an example of dirt and mold damage um, this is pretty typical. Any of you that have been in a grandparent's attic or basement, you've probably seen something like this. They've stored treasured items in a suitcase and uh, they suffered from environmental conditions. And it is very hard once um, you have damage like this to recover from it. Um, it can be cleaned. Uh, by a conservator, but um, mold can tend to stain clothing and it's very, very hard to remove it. So, pest damage um, or pests. Textiles are a food source for hungry insects. You want to check your textiles periodically for infestation because uh, infestations can happen quickly. So, periodic checks are a great way to avoid damage. Um, you can also monitor by using little sticky traps that you can buy uh, from some conservation um, supply companies. Um, you can improve uh, sanitation in your storage area by removing and discarding clutter, which will help um, uh, in avoiding pest infestations. Um, but you want to make sure that you leave food and drinks outside of storage areas. Do not bring them into your storage areas. Um, you're just asking for trouble. If you have an infestation, you want to isolate the artifact. Um, you can, if it's small enough, you can put it in polyethylene bags and then consult a pest control specialist and a conservator. Um, your pest control specialist, if um, you talk with them and you can come up with solutions rather than spraying down your textiles uh, on how to remove them. And I think that um, CCAHA also had um, a webinar on um, pest management in a museum. So um, just to name a few pests that you uh, might come across in textile storage, there are clothes moths, um, those are both the webbing and case making moths, carpet beetles, cockroaches, mice, um, and those we have in abundance here in the state of Alabama. Um, I've added a link um, to the handout, and if it's not there, uh, to uh, it's a handout on the dirty dozen of museum pests um, in the resource list. So just to give you a look, a little insect damage. Uh, we have a, a coat here with some moth damage. Uh, oh, thanks, Samantha. And here's a little um, closer view of uh, the carcass and carcasses and uh, things that pests leave behind. And these are all um, images that are courtesy of uh, Museum Textile Services, which is a wonderful resource. Um, and I'll have, they're actually listed on their resource list. And you can see more damage here. Poor, poor flags. Oops. There we go. Yeah, and, and this is damage from moths, and there's carpet beetles, uh, but mainly moths. So, the do's and don'ts of storing textiles. The do's. Um, you want to monitor your storage environment. Uh, clean debris and dirt from textiles before storing. You really don't want to bring that into your storage area with uh, nice clean textiles. Uh, you want to use acid-free boxes, tubes, and unbuffered acid-free tissue. Uh, use padding when folding textiles. Uh, environmental you know of course store in a cool dry location and if textiles need to hang use padded hangers uh, the don'ts avoid using trunks suitcases cardboard boxes and sealed plastic containers remember uh, sealing uh, your textiles in is actually not good for them. You can create microclimates where you have issues of uh, mold uh, if you aren't careful. 
You want to avoid folding textiles without padding and avoid overstacking artifacts in boxes. And remember, you want to maintain good, safe environments where you monitor your light, heat, humidity, and pest. And when in doubt, call a professional. So, our last little bit here are resources. And this is actually the same thing that is in the PDF handout on the left. And you can print that out and uh, find these resources. Um, I've put in uh, places where you can find acid-free boxes, tubes, and tissues. Um, you, there's a handout on light levels. Uh, there's also a tutorial from the Minnesota Historical Society on how to make padded hangers. And um, there's also several different um, websites for more information on caring for textiles. You have uh, AIC, um, Museum Textile Services, which I have found immensely uh, useful. They have a whole resources section themselves where you can go in and look at everything from how to vacuum a textile and then how to hang uh, quilts and tapestries. Uh, the National Park Service has a wonderful museum handbook which covers everything from lighting issues to handling textiles. And then of course the Minnesota Historical Society actually has a YouTube channel dedicated to the care of textiles. So um, that's it for me. Do you guys have any questions? I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Yes, thank you, Ryan. And while you guys are typing up your questions down there, I just wanted to let everyone know that we will actually have an opportunity to go visit Ryan in person at the Alabama Department of Archives and History on November 9th. We will be holding um, a conference there um, that's kind of um, wrapping up the first the first hopefully pilot project of the regional heritage stewardship program which is what is um, funding this webinar and some of the in-person workshops that some of you have attended um, so we will be putting out some more registration information about that um, soon but we will get to look kind of at some of the things we've seen here in pictures so that's pretty exciting um, and kind of get a chance to talk about uh, any further questions or things we might have had after uh, the two-year pilot program of the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program. And it looks like you guys have lots of questions, so I'm going to turn it back over to Ryan so she can um, answer those. <laughs> They're coming through, man. All right. Let they me, are. Uh, how can I go up? I can, oh, here we go. Well, I will help you. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, Christina asks, are there considerations we um, should be considering when rolling a quilt? Uh, yes, um, I, it, you need assistance when rolling a quilt. Um, and always uh, try to make sure that it is as square on the tube as much as possible. And you also want to make sure that you're not um, rolling it too tight because that can actually cause stress to the, the fabric itself. Um, also, let's see, uh, rolling, let's see. Yeah, uh, you don't want to stress it, and uh, you want to make sure that it, as you're working with it, it's supported. And again, uh, we use uh, Mylar as the barrier afterwards, only because we have so many people coming through um, doing research on our text, our, our quilts, that it makes it easier for us instead of having to unroll it and re-roll it back, they can actually view the quilt pattern, colors, and the stitching uh, by looking through the mylar. Okay, next question. Um, the next one I see is from Maya, and she wants to know, how do you decrease or eliminate existing folds on costumes if ironing is not an option? Oh, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, well, 
the problem is um, some things are a little delicate, so you, you wouldn't want to steam uh, silk um, if you have um, existing folds in, in a silk. Uh, you would just you want to make sure if you're folding a textile that you're folding it in a different area and as long as the there's no stress in those creases you sh those existing creases you're folding it in a different area you shouldn't have an issue does that answer that question um Christina has a follow-up question to her uh, quilt rolling question. Um, she she wants to know about if there's sort of embellishments on the quilt. I know the quilt she's talking about um, <laughs> as I visited her site, but uh, uh, yeah, there's some kind of embellishments on it. So how you could she go about rolling it? You can actually lay acid-free tissue over the quilt as you're rolling it um, if there are embellishments so that it doesn't catch on anything or itself. So you just um, lay it out on the the quilt as, as you're rolling it. Yes, yeah. Kind of like interleaving, sort of, um, essentially. Yeah. Um, Ellie wants to know if you are washing muslin, what temperature uh, of I water should you be using? I throw mine in on, um, well, I have one of those front loaders, and I just throw it in on delicate cycle. And I do the same thing when I put it in the dryer. It takes a little longer to dry, but I just, um, to be safe, I always put it on a delicate cycle. Great. Um, Rachel is asking, can you put down a layer of tissue before rolling yes. a textile on <laughs> a tube? And it is sort of like interleaving. Um, Ones that are a little more fragile, uh, I would highly recommend uh, putting in uh, that extra layer. Uh, quilts that are a little more sturdy, you don't have any damage or fracturing to it, um, I would say you can roll it on the quilt and not see any issues. Great. Um, and it looks like the last question here is, um, can you put muslin in a dryer after? Yes you wash Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, you just want to put it on a delicate cycle. I know that is not the case with yeah. Tyvek. Yeah, muslin, yes. Um, uh, um, I, have, I have melted yeah. Tyvek in a dryer before, but muslin's, yeah, muslin's different. different. <laughs> uh, especially if you're using uh, cotton muslin or a cotton polyester blend muslin, um, those are a little bit easier to work with. Um, Tyvek, I don't use it that often. Uh, you can uh, use it in textile storage, uh, but I find that I use muslin more than I use anything else when it comes to fabric materials. All right, it looks like we made it through the questions. Um, Great. And so if there aren't any more questions, I'll let everybody get back to their day. But a big thank you to Ryan. This was a fabulous web webinar. I learned a lot. So big, big appreciation from us here at CCAHA. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing your um, storage and your museum in person oh, in November. Thank you guys. And I'm going to, um, I don't know if that I listed my uh, email address on here, but my email address, if you want to contact me with additional questions or if you're like, oh, hey, Ryan, what is this? Uh, my email address is ryan.blocker at archives.alabama.gov, and I'm going to type it in here really quick for you. Um, but um, that's kind of what my job here is, is to uh, assist with anything textile related. There you go. All right, thank you guys. Uh, this was fun. I hope that you learned something new. Right. Great. Thank you, everybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Have a good rest of your day and weekend.